All righty. Well, welcome, everyone. We're uh, honored to have Dr. Uh, Barrios join us, who is a board certified general surgeon with additional qualifications in surgical critical care. He's a professor, he's a clinical professor of surgery at UCI School of Medicine and also the Dean of Admission at the UC Irvine School of Medicine. Um, he is um, he he has been involved in admissions for a few years now, and we've had the uh, honor of having him the last few years uh, since our founding join us almost every year. Um, he also has a heart for passion and service and has done numerous trips to Nicaragua, El Salvador, Peru, and Colombia for International Medical Alliance organizations. Uh, we're glad that he's able to join us today. <laughs> Thank you all for joining. Um, you're gonna get to see me chewing the last of my pancakes, but um, good morning and uh, congratulations for being here um, because you are doing what I tell people is an important part of the process, which is go find resources, uh, this being an excellent one. Um, go ask questions and I'm here to answer a lot, a lot of questions. I do a very informal talk based on how UCI and many places deal with the admissions process and how we look at your applications so that you can tailor your activities um, based on how we're going to look at it, right? Um, so I'm going to start with a few things. Um, your GPA and your MCAT are the first step. Um, I can't tell you what exactly we look for. Some of it is proprietary, but I will tell you this. Um, and this is true of UCI only, and it's not even the exact numbers, but our average GPA is above 3.8 for students that we accept. And our average MCAT is in the 515 to 518 range, to give you an idea. Um, that means there's a lot of people above, there's a lot of people below. And speaking of diversity and equity, we take uh, challenges and diverse experiences uh, <clears throat> into consideration. So if you don't meet those numbers, don't be crestfallen because even at that average, there's obviously a lot of kids below and a lot of kids, I call you guys kids because I have enough gray hair. Um, and so... Um, that's the first step. And then if you make it past that and, and we're looking at your application, what, what what do we look at? What do we look for? And I'll tell you, and because like I've already, I've already kind of been like, we have a committee that looks at these things, um, but I take uh, this personally and I've done an exceptional job. You see, I don't think I'm going to read as the most I've ever read, but I, I already read my 890th application for this cycle Um personally. Um, so I can tell you what I look for and, and what most of us look for. We have a rubric. It gets you points based on, sorry, that little stuff kind of going back and forth in the background is my hanging pots and pans. Um, uh, that is my kitchen, uh, which is painted a deep, well, it's called cranberry red. But anyways, um, uh, the activities section, what are we looking for, right? We're looking for research, we're looking for community service, and we're looking for um, uh, clinical activity. And, and why do we do that? Are we torturing you? Are we making you go through hoops and weeding people out? No, this is what I tell people. And, and by the way, I'm a little bit blunt. Um, and whenever I do these things, I am thanked for how honest I am. So if it seems blunt, it's on purpose. It's just me. Um, I'm a surgeon, so not a trauma surgeon at that. So <laughs> we're very blunt about everything. Um, so are you willing to advance the science of medicine a little bit? The reality is that most of you are not, but it also works the other way, right? You're going to be presented with a lot of information, a lot of journals that say, this is the next best thing. <clears throat> this is the way you should be treating your paper because we did a, uh, your patients, because we did a paper on it. And how do you know that that paper is written well, right? Because I can tell you, sometimes you read a paper and you're like, oh, this is obviously so, no pun intended, doctored that you know, some other studies should come along. So we want you to have not just the ability to perhaps go on to advance our, our field of medicine, um, but to understand what's coming your way and, and, and to be able to uh, tell if it's a 
good suggestion or a kind of like a weak suggestion kind of hidden inside a paper uh, in a journal. So that's the reason we look at that. And then we look at clinical activity, right? We had almost 4,000 applications this year of people who had this fantasy that they wanted to go to medical school. And how do I know that you really thought about this, that you know what you're getting yourself into, right? Uh, and <clears throat> that is the only way I could, you can you can do that, and it sometimes helps, is um, go out there and do it, right? If you're out there facing patients and helping doctors face patients, uh, or you know, you're a medical assistant and you're dealing with the patients yourselves, or you're a scribe, these are the popular things now, um, you know, uh, a clinical research coordinator, as long as it's really hands-on. Um, so that you know what you're getting yourself into and you wake up one morning and go, oh, this isn't what I thought. And then, you know, you're you're already down the rabbit hole. And then the community service. Um, you know, I don't care how you slice it. Here I am on a Saturday morning. I am doing this completely voluntarily because I believe in helping people who really want to get to where they want to go, especially to achieve a field um, as honorable as, as mine. And so we sacrifice ourselves a little bit, right? And, and this is a sacrificed field. I sometimes work insane hours. Um, and so how do I know otherwise that you're willing to give of yourself above and beyond? Um, and, and the only way I could do that is to see if you've you know, done some community activities, done some leadership activities, uh, now, I know somebody's going to ask me how much. Um, there's really no magic formula. There is a private rubric that we kind of sort of use, but I don't need you to do 10,000 hours of anything, you know, and, and I will kind of sort of say that somewhere between 500 hours and 1,000 hours is, is, is probably enough, but that it's really not even sometimes the hours. Um, it, it's... Did you stick to it? Did you do a couple of things for a long period of time? You know, uh, we look at these things like, oh, I had a summer off, so I did this. And, and I had a couple months off, so I did that. I had a winter break, so I did this. Um, I'd rather see that you stuck with one job description or, or one service of, uh, description uh, over a longer period of time because that shows commitment um, and, you know, what I call stick to um, a little bit of grit. Um, cause it, it's, it's challenging to stick to one thing. And, you know, so I see these kids that like, okay, let's say they got to a thousand hours, but it's because they did 115 hour of this, uh, 200 hours of that, 300 hours of this over summer breaks, winter breaks, <clears throat> um, went to go dig a well in Guatemala. Um, then, then that's all fine and dandy. There's nothing wrong with it, but two things a you should really stick to just a handful of things two or three that really go over a long period of time especially a job if that's what you have or even if you're volunteering in a position clinically but also um it does it make sense to you right and and, and here's what i mean by that you know oh i i I did Habitat for Humanity. I did Kemp Kesem. I taught autistic kids how to ride horses. Uh, I dug a well in Guatemala. Um, it, 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 it's scattered and it doesn't have a theme to it. I'd rather you, and I will tell you, there's nothing wrong with any of those activities. But, you know, if you tell me that your family owned a construction company and therefore you did Habitat for Humanity, makes sense to me. Um, and I kid you not, this is an actual example a candidate whose sibling had autism. And so she did the thing with, with teaching autistic kids how to ride horses. So it's not that just that you did it, but it, that it's part of your actual real narrative, right? If you're an athletic person uh, or, or, you know, you were some sort of club basketball player, let's say you went to some, you know, neighborhood and you taught high school kids or, or, you know, smaller kids how to go play basketball and that's your community service, but that makes sense to you. And so that that's kind of what we look for. And then the other thing in the uh, application process is the next, or part of the application, I should say, is the personal statements, right? You're going to write your big personal statement, and then you're going to write the, your, your secondary questions, right? UCIs are usually something like, what are you most proud of that you accomplished, or what was a challenge that you had to face? What do you want to put in there? 
right? So there's a couple of absolute don'ts. Um, one is what we call the laundry list. Um, and that is, I did this and this and this and this and this and this, and now I'm ready to go to medical school. Uh, that doesn't really tell me anything about you that's different from the 3,999 other kids. What am I looking for? Oh, and the other thing, please, dear God, and I say this and, and I've said it repeatedly because I say it every time I, I, I give one of these presentations is I know that your grandparents are special to you. But for instance, even this year, after reading 890 applications that start off with a sick grandparent, they are not special to me. Um, and it sounds kind of harsh, but the but again, the point of, of the first thing and the second thing was how do you set yourself apart in your personal statement? What experiences or what insights do you have that are different that inspire you or your vision of medicine that might be different from other people's based on what you have experienced or what you've lived or or or, or what you've you know kind of boiled it down to that's what i'm looking for because i can write <laughs> i can write about half the personal statements in 5 minutes that i've read this year and it goes like this um, I used to play checkers with Nana or Pop Pop, and then they couldn't remember anymore, or then they had a stroke and couldn't play anymore. And so I decided <clears throat> to find out what the basic science behind these problems were. So I went to go work in somebody's lab, but then I realized that that didn't have a personal touch. So I went to go work at an assisted living facility with older people that meet that description. And then like, they even have like memory care centers. But then I realized that I just I want to treat these patients, be, be part of the treatment. So I went to work in somebody's office or clinic or, or emergency department. And now I'm ready to go to medical school, right? So, so is there anything particularly wrong with that? Is it going to hurt you? No. But is it going to give you that extra little oomph? Um, that, that's what you want your personal statement to do for you. I mean, is it okay that you? that's the best you can do? It's it, like I said, it's not going to take any points away from you, but it's 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 not going to give you a little extra um, and, and that's our philosophy behind that. Um, and and yes, I'm sure you're all going to read or will have read the, uh, you know, how to write a personal statement, start off with a catchphrase that catches people and all that kind of stuff. And that's all fine and generically, you know, okay. But but try to make it you. What about you? It's going to catch my attention compared to everybody else. That, that That's the point of that. And then the, if you get past all that and we select you for an interview, what happens? Um, it's, it's actually pretty good because we're almost 50-50 once you get to the interview phase. So it's almost kind of up to you to mess it up. Um, and, and there's a science behind it. And especially now that it's on Zoom and, and, and not in person. You know, did you wear something decent and neat? And, you know, was your tie askew? You didn't wear a tank top. Your hair was, you know, combed. Uh, you know, you just looked professional. That, that, that's what we're looking for. Don't forget that. Have somebody give you a once over before you go on the camera. Um, and uh, make, make that that's a start. Make sure the lighting is okay. I'm not... It, saying you should go buy anything. I know some people are like, oh, I'm going to go get the ring light. You know, like, I, I don't need you to go that far. Don't have, I just need you to have good lighting so that you're not like, I would honestly tell you right now, my lighting is kind of sketch. Um, uh, you, you, you want them to plainly see your features because we're looking for physical cues. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of harp on that a little bit in a second, but um, so don't have your face in the dark. Um, good internet connection have a good internet connection um the uh what was the other thing i was going to say oh weird things in the background that's why my background is is fuzzy today because there's some stuff going on in the background and so i, I didn't need for you guys to be part of that um don't have weird signs or symbols or things that could be politically or religiously charged in the background um and, and I know that your political affiliations and your religious affiliations are very important to you. Um, but it is, we, we willfully and purposefully take those things out of the background as a potential for bias. Um, so, so please don't inadvertently bring those things uh, into the foreground for yourself. Um, 
And, 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 and then the last thing I'm going to say before I open it up to a lot of questions, which I know is what you guys really kind of sort of like, um, is, um, just be normal, be yourself, have a good range of emotions. Um, and, and it's okay. Don't be too nervous. Don't be too much of an introvert. If that's a thing for you, go out and do Toastmasters to make you more comfortable with with, you know, speaking in a, in a not shy manner, because we're looking really half the interview is just to make sure that you're okay and that you're going to be a reasonable fit and that you're not going to be a trouble child. And that, and, and this is kind of like the, the joke part, but it's kind of real that you can keep the crazy down for 30 minutes, right? Because if you can't keep the crazy down for 30 minutes, then what hope do I have that you're going to do that for four years in medical school? So, uh, and, and I will give you a funny example before I, I go on to let people start asking questions. I had a girl who, um, a female applicant, I should say, who um, was doing well. And this was back in the day when it was in person. Um, and and she was doing fine. And I, I, would, I would tell her, like, she was down to the 27 minute point. And I always ask a question which we try to incorporate a lot is, is what do you do for yourself? That's just for you to blow off steam, have fun, you know, have, um, you know, revamp yourself or recharge the batteries. And because I want to know, again, that's part of that thing. Who are you, diff, diff, you know, apart from everybody else and how do you blow off steam and, and what do you enjoy in life? And so that's a non-medical question. You'd be surprised how many times that trips people up. So what does she do? Well, she had written in her application that her mother um, owned a music studio and she played the piano. And by the way, <clears throat> there are questions that we are not allowed to ask and we steer away from and, and uh, they're, they're perfectly, you know, uh, <clears throat> normal questions. I can't ask you as I kind of alluded, you know, political affiliations, religious affiliations, uh, personal identification, uh, whether it's <clears throat> sexual identity or anything else, marital status, all these things are off the table. However, if you put it on your application, it becomes fair game. So be careful what you put on there is, is that lesson. But aside from that, so she puts that on there and she says, and I ask her the fateful question, right? Well, what do you do in your spare time? And she says, well, I like to teach people how to play the piano. Well, I thought that was a fantastic answer, right? She's teaching, you know, passing on skills, patience, repetitive grit, you know, having a goal, all, all these things that go along with being a teacher of anything, but in particular, something as technically demanding as, as playing the piano. So I thought, oh, so I ask her mistakenly, well, do you do this at home or do you do this out of your mother's studio? Well, her face completely changed. She got angry and she starts saying, no, I would never work out of my mother's studio because she says that I owe her everything and I'm not going to add anything to the list that I need to be grateful for. I was looking for my panic button. Um, I, I mean, why do I bring that story up? <laughs> Because if you cannot keep your personal issues down for 30 minutes, if you can't keep the crazy down for, it's going to affect your ability to work, right? What happens when she gets an older female attending that she feels grades her harshly? Um, is she going to lose it? What happens if she has a patient that doesn't go along with what she's saying or recommending to the patient? Is she going to lose it? So you, you, you got to you gotta keep the crazy down uh and, and and be normal and have a normal breadth of of emotion it's okay to smile it's okay to joke lightly um it's okay to giggle or, or laugh a little bit you know um and 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 so people think it all has to be completely serious you just just be normal anyways <clears throat> i'm sure that gives you a lot of information to work on i'm sure that's even going to have generated some questions um and so we will give some time to that so we can, uh, so I can skedaddle on to my next thing at 11 o'clock. So the first question, do you factor an applicant's undergraduate admission institution? For example, if somebody goes to UCLA, is it more valuable than going to Cal State LA? That's a great question. And we do not. And we don't care if you do all four years of this or all four years of that, or two years of this and two years of that. It's all the same. <clears throat> Sorry. So people say, oh, but all of your students are from UC. You know, 
whether it's Santa Barbara or UCLA or, or San Diego or, you know, all of the UC schools that, that, you know, have students applying, it's because that's where the majority of the kids are applying from. So here's the math, right? If 80 to 85% of my kids are coming are applying from a UC school, it is likely that the population is going to be made up 80 to 85% of UC kids, right? But I don't even care if they're out of state, which is another question. Um, I don't care if you did two years, uh, like I said, at, at a community college because it's cheaper and more affordable and then you can go back. I don't care if you did a couple of your prereqs, um, you know, not, you know, during a summer session. Like I get these questions all the time. It doesn't really matter. Did you meet all the prerequisites and was it a certified school? That, that's all we really care. Do you, prefer, uh, do you prefer to see early applications? And can you talk a little bit about rolling admissions too? Cause I think uh, yeah, so there is a little bit of the gung-ho kids tend to apply on what is it like May 31st or June 1st or whatever the, and they're waiting with their finger hovering over the 1201. But those are the kids that are also likely to have a really good GPA, really good application, really good MCAT. Really. And, and, and it is rolling. So we do tend to see a little bit of a drop off um, in the, um, quality of the applications in terms of what we look for and the number of hours put in and all that kind of stuff. And so I really do encourage it. Is it, is it a death knell? No. Um, but are we likely to judge you a little more as we have started to fill up our spots and we're looking for those really excellent extra, um, you know, extra kids. Um, and, and, and I, I, I was reading some applications last night, so it is a rolling process. It takes months. Um, and I found a good couple of ones. So it's not like always like if you put it in towards the end, you're not going to get looked at. However, um, it does behoove you uh, to turn them in like, like jokingly like at 12 or 1 on, on June 1st or whatever the, I don't know, the deadline is. So, and, and I do tell people, because I start getting this question this time of year, I haven't heard back yet. I haven't heard anything. No news is good news in terms of like, you haven't been rejected yet, right? Yeah. The only the ones that are really hearing things so far, are the ones that have started to be outright rejected. So um, don't, don't panic if you're not getting now, should you have gotten a couple of interviews by this time of year already? Yes, because we've already done our four or five cycles, but um, uh, the the answer is it, it it does help you to turn them in earlier, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to know right away whether you got accepted or not or or put on a hold. So this person is stating that they have a hard time writing a personal statement. Are there any advice you would give me on what to include in my essay? Yeah, you know, I get this question a lot. I get, I do some one-on-ones. I can't do too many, but um, um, what is of interest to you? What do you like to do? Are you a photographer? Are you an artist? Are you a singer? Are you, you know, uh, um, you know, a gymnastics Olympics kid? Like, I, I don't care what it is. Did your, like I said, was your family, did they work in a, con, you know, construction company? Anything that makes you, you and start with that. Um, yeah, anything that stuck out for you, be very wary about putting in too many medical problems. I mean, yes, you're going to probably have been inspired by something. Don't start off with that. Um, it's a little cliche. Put that somewhere in the middle of the paper. So again, if you had a very dear to you sick grandparent and, and they did have some thing that, that inspired you, like why is this happening to them and, and that motivated you, put it somewhere in the middle of the paper couple sentences be done with it um I, I always do tell people be careful about becoming maudlin and that is don't become over emotional don't become you know like oh woe is me because you know, be careful of that we're looking for grit we're not looking for a list of complaints um and so the best advice is think about who you are what your likes and interests and experiences have been you know, I write, you know, kids who write like, well, my dad was in the military and I had some issues because, 
you know, I got dragged around every couple of years to a different, you know, uh, deployment camp or, or I got moved across overseas. Well, that's an experience that's different from everybody else's. And you can put that in there and somehow you can tie that into how that made you the person you are today that's interested in medicine. Um, so uh, there's no right or wrong answer other than talk about you. Just sit there and think about what what makes me, if I had to, if I wasn't sitting in front of somebody and they asked me, well, what's the most interesting thing about you or what's a highlight about you? What would you answer? And 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 can you tie that into your interest in medicine? I, I think that's probably one of the better generic advices that I could offer. I have one of these things, journals, you could even do it on your phone, but just take notes of your experiences and thought. It's not a, it's, you can't write it in one sit down, it's not an assignment. It's, it's a process. I mean, I've heard some people that take them up to six months to write a good personal statement. So, yeah. all right. And by the way, please have somebody look at it because make sure it's decent. Make sure you didn't inadvertently write something weird in there. Um, and then trust me, I've seen it. Um, so you want to see how other people react to your statement before you submit it. So uh, what are your thoughts on graduating university early? Would it be a disadvantage for graduating in one and a half years due to taking many community college courses in high school? Um, probably going to be a problem because, not because of the grades and, 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 and you met the requisites and all that. I don't care how long it took you to do it, but you didn't have time in a year and a half to do all of these things that we're looking for, right? You didn't have time to do research. You didn't have time to do community service. You didn't have time to, to you know, work in an office or as a scribe or, you know, something in a year and a half. Uh, you're just not going to rack up enough hours. You're going to do yourself a disservice. You're probably going to look at, and I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. Um, but you're probably looking at gap years. So does it, you know, create an advantage? Does it create a disadvantage? Maybe in the sense that that you probably didn't give yourself enough time to do all the other things we look at. Because again, I can't stress this enough. It's not the GPA and the MCAT. All right. It's once the GPA and the MCAT got you past the door, it becomes a lesser factor, right? It, it just, um, yes, if you got a 503, there's a, you know, compared to the person who got a 520, but you know, if we're looking at your application, we're looking at your application. Don't, don't, you know, in, in other words, the, the, you know, the, the, the wunder kids um, that graduated when they were 16, good for you. Um, but you didn't have time to do all the other things. It's, it's multifactorial, right? I mean, if you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be a, uh, you know, a rocket scientist and all that. Yeah. You could do that when you're 16. I don't care. Um, but medicine to be cliche is still a people person profession. You need time to have developed, you know, empathy and communication skills, uh, the warm fuzzies. Um, and, and so don't think that because you got a 4.0 and a 100% on your MCAT that that's going to get it, get you an automatic ticket. I turn that kid down all the time. Um, because I mean, it becomes obvious that they spent so much time focusing on that, that they didn't focus on the external things that I talk about. And, and it's, it's, um, it's a negative for them. The other thing is also you have 168 hours in a week and for you to be a functioning human, you need to sleep around 40 hours. So it's just not oh, enough time. Oh my God. Yes. And oh, by the way. Don't try to overinflate your hours because we do the math, right? And and I get the kid who tries and I and and they and they kind of shoot themselves in the foot because they say, Oh, I did 4,000 hours in one year of X. Okay, so let me put it this way: 4,000 hours in one year is an 80-hour work week, plus going to school, plus your research, plus your community activity. You can't do it. So don't, don't, don't think that you're going to impress me by hours that didn't happen because I'll do the math and I will add different stuff up. I will do like, well, if he's doing 16, 12 to 16 credits plus a 40, or in this case, trying to come across with an 80 hour work week, plus, you know, did a habitat for humanity, like, like, it, no. So it becomes an ethics problem, right? 
So please don't think you're you're going to cheat your way through it because we figure it out. Does UCI School of Medicine consider the community college GPA separate from a four-year university GPA, or are they combined GPA of both? Nope. We went over that. We don't care where the, it came from. Your GPA is your GPA. And, and by the way, we're really more interested in your science GPA um, courses than we are in some of the other courses. Yes, we look at the whole thing, but we really do look a lot at, at the requisite science course grades. Yeah, the, the problem is the UC system and the CSU is once you transfer from a community college, when you graduate, your community college GPA is not included. It's just your UC GPA. But for medical school, every GPA is included in the total. Yeah. Um, in mm -hmm. any type of research uh, for application or specifically medical research, most of my research so far has been psychological. Yeah. I, I, you know, I kind of joke about that. I don't care if it's underwater basket weaving, if the left-handed style is better than the right-handed style and you did a study to compare those. The point is, did you learn the processes, right? Did you learn how to apply for uh, an IRB? Did you learn how to gather data? Did you learn how to analyze data? Did you learn how to present the data? Write an abstract. These are all phases that go into doing research. And if you can do each and every one of those steps or showing me that you have, um, that's really what kind of counts. I don't care if it was psychology or something on field mice or basic science. I mean, you'd be surprised. Like I see everything. Clinical is really nice, um, but it's not entirely necessary. Most, most, I have a whole hour lecture on what type of research, um, which I won't go through here, obviously, but, um, most of you will have done basic science research of some, some sort of you, some of you will have done some clinical research, um, you know, working with physicians that are, you know, physician scientists and, and, and that's perfectly fine, but it doesn't really matter exactly what it is. <clears throat> this person wants to know, should they stick to one research lab or would it be okay to switch? Um, I would rather you stick to the one. Uh, or as if you did like one year of this and one year of that, that's perfectly fine too. Um, but again, it goes back to what I mentioned before, right? I'd rather see you sticking to one or two things as opposed to flitting around. Does UCI, uh, how does UCI look at applicants that are older than 30? Not an issue. How does UCI review post -bac students? Are his previous uh, GPA considered after a post -bac is completed? Uh, we do look at your GPA after, um, and actually we get the report of what your GPA kind of was and um, and, and was after your post -bac. So we, we do get the before and after. Um, we kind of look at the after and we, we do look at the post -bac, right? Because if you had some extenuating circumstance, um, and then you got a 4.0 on your post back, then, okay, something happened there that, um, that if you explain it, it's explainable because, you know, somebody, somebody has deaths in the family or somebody has to move or somebody, you know, somebody has a family illness and stuff like that happens. You have an opportunity to put something in there, um, like that if you want to, all right, that pen's killing me. There we go. Um, a little better. Uh, so the answer is we we are aware of when you do the post -backs, we are aware of what your GPA is. And so um, we can look at that and, and base it on that. <clears throat> this person wants to know um, the applica uh, the research, um, have, uh, is, do you have to be published uh, author to, to count as research and how many people have publications? Do not have to publish. You do get brownie points for publishing, um, is what I can say about that. Um, but also, but also, talk only about a percentage, only a percentage of kids have an actual publication. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, out of a hundred, like uh, I don't know, maybe twenty. Like I don't know. Not, not. In other words, doesn't really matter. It gets you a little extra brownie point. Um, is the way we look at at it, but it's not at all necessary. Can you talk? Well, the threshold of getting publication is very high. It's so it's, you know, there's a lot of other people. So, but I think also 
doing a doing a poster presentation that's considered you know uh so but, you know going to a conference and presenting that's uh something that you can do um <clears throat> So uh, what would uh, volunteer hours in a hospital be considered community service? And what sort of community service would you recommend? Like, what is that one community service you want to see? Yeah, I want to see the one. I, we went over this, right? I want to <laughs> see the one that makes sense to you. That's um, important to you. Yeah, um, because I, I don't care. Like, I really honestly don't. I The things that I most often see, and, it's, and I have no preference, you know, like I said, Camp Kesem, Kids with Cancer, uh, Habitat for Humanity, which has nothing to do with medicine, right? Um, you know, teaching kids how to play basketball, nothing to do with medicine. Uh, reading, uh, you know, helping, you know, after school reading hours. Uh, it could be anything. It's just does it make sense? You know, there was, you know, uh, feed the homeless. Uh, you know, you know, you worked with grandmas that quilted things to give blankets to people. I, it just doesn't matter really. It just, it's just something that has to be meaningful to you. And that it's obvious that, that you're not doing it because you're checking off the boxes. Cause we can tell when you're checking off the boxes. And again, things that you do that we can tell you're checking off the boxes. Again, you move from one thing to another thinking that a lot of different things is helpful for your application. They, none of it makes sense to who you are. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, what do you call it? Like a smorgasbord of, of, of activities. Like stick to the ones that make sense to you that you enjoy. And that's, that's going to be taken more seriously than two months of this, three months of that one summer here, a winter break there. I mean, that's all fine and dandy, but it's, it's, we can tell that's just you trying too hard. You get excited when you go to it. That's I think the bigger. Yeah. Question. What do you uh do you like to see people who have medical med uh military service and what things uh do you want do you see veterans talk about in their application? Yeah, so um a couple of things that 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 do be just because it represents hours of grit, um hours of of commitment, um hours of discipline, anybody who um I mean, what do we give brownie points for? And, and and mind you, brownie points doesn't mean it gets your foot in the door. Brownie points means you get an extra gold star, right? And so um, college athletes, uh, you know, Olympians, people who are professional musicians of some sort. Uh, yes, the military is nice because the military, we do take that seriously as as you, that is service. You have served your country. Um so we do take that into consideration. Uh, and and so, you know, that was a long answer for yes. <laughs> yeah. Last Saturday, we had uh, seven veterans who are medical students who did a panel and go check out because a lot of them had some really good things to talk about, like some of the leadership that you've done in the military. Like one guy was talking about, like he was in charge of navigation on a, ship that's worth billions of dollars and had 3,000 people on it. That's that's leadership, you know. Um, and that takes a lot. Uh, this person wants to know uh, what are, about online degrees. They work full time and they're taking their biomedical science degrees online at ASU. How, how is that looked upon? Um, that, that's a very specific question. <laughs> um, uh, again, I honestly don't care what your final, I, personally, your your final GPA that I see when your screen flashes up at me is your final GPA. I don't care where they came from. Again, as long as it was an accredited, med accredited medical school, um, then it doesn't really matter. So this question is about gap years. Do you discourage that? I've heard that, you uh, know, people that do gap years are less likely there's also another question. Uh, this is this is a gap year question. There's another one that you absolutely have to do two year gap, or what's the what's the deal on that? Yes, that is my. Um... There's people say you should, and people say you shouldn't. There's yeah. people say that you must. <laughs> Let me tell you about gap years. It's going to take the rest of our meeting. 
Um, no, it, it's, it's, I personally, okay. Don't misinterpret my personal feeling about it versus what the reality is. And in fact, it's funny you should ask that question because I am looking at a research project just now that we're in the stats phase on 37,000 applicants from over the years at UCI, right? About gap years. I personally hate them. Um, I, I think it's getting ridiculous. I think it's becoming one year now most, you know, first it was no gap years. Then it was like, here come the gap years or gap a gap year. Now here come two gap years. Uh, you know, I'm going to be graduating kids when they're 45 ready for AARP, right? And so I personally don't like them, but it's going to be one of two things, right? If you've done all the things that I told you is what we look at and you think you have that, why would you wait and do a gap year, right? You don't need to. Here's two things that are, here's the two type of kids that are doing the gap years. The extra gunners that think that now because, you know, they want to be more competitive and they want to do 10,000 hours of this or that, which is what I told you is not necessary, are doing that to make themselves even more supposedly. And so they're, they're making it tougher for everybody else. And, and, but, and so that kind of annoys me. Um, but two, here's the other kid. Is it the disadvantaged kid? And we can't use the term disadvantaged anymore. People with challenges, um, to, to getting to their goals. And is it that because they had to work, I don't care, uh, I'm, not to throw anybody under the bus, or, is it that you had to work at a Starbucks to feed yourself and to have a car and to have a roof over your head while you're going to school and you don't have time to do all of those other activities that I just mentioned. You don't have the, the luxury of going off and doing a Habitat for Humanity over the weekend because uh, you had to work and you can't go, you know, dig a well in Guatemala because you had to be here working, you know, and, and so you are challenged to get all those things done while you're in school. Yeah. You're going to have to do a gap year, right? There's just no way around it. I, I, I see that. But on the other hand, I'm also kind of annoyed by the kid that has absolutely no need to do the gap year that does because a, they want to be quote unquote more competitive, um, or uh, they're trying too hard, and and so they're kind of still ruining, and they're just making the 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 curve longer and longer and wider and wider, and so uh, it's a mixed bag. Do you need to do it? No. Um, if you oh, oh, and this is the other thing too. If you don't get in um, the first time around, look at your application, figure out for yourself where you think your weak spots were. Like okay you you worked in a research lab and you worked in a doctor's office, but you didn't do any community service. You probably lost some points there. Uh, did you already graduate and your GPA was 3.2? Okay. Oh, by the way, also nothing more annoying than the kid who has no introspection, got a 517 on your MCAT and, and close to a 4.0. And then they go and they retake the MCAT. I can guarantee you that it wasn't your MCAT, right? So have some introspection on why you think you didn't get in um, or ask somebody, right? Ask your counselors, ask your pre-med advisors, ask some deans of admission. Um, you know, they're going to give you generic uh, answers because we can't tell you, oh, it was your GPA. And then you go and you work and you get a you know better GPA somehow. Uh, and then you still don't get in. And then you can come back and say, well, he told me it was my GPA. So we, we, we can't give you direct um responses, but we can give you ideas of like, and, and here it is. Here's what I'm going to tell you if you don't get in. What kind of research did you do? What kind of clinical service did you do? What kind of community service did you do? Um, you know, did you have somebody look at your personal statement? Go back through your application because it is a myth, urban myth, that if you didn't get in once, you're never going to get in again because we like to see the kids actually who didn't get in, obviously figured out what the weak spots were in their application and worked hard to improve that area of their application, right? And within the year that they, you know, didn't get in and, and had to reapply, did they go and figure out that they needed to work in a doctor's office? Did they figure out that they, you know, needed to go do some community service? Did they, you know, all these things that you could do 
to improve your application. We like grit. We like perseverance because that's what medicine is. And so that is an urban myth that if you didn't get in, you shouldn't. It's also an urban myth that that you shouldn't try to put your application in again, because if you didn't get in, we're going to look at it differently. Long and the short of it is I hate it. It's not entirely necessary for the kids that were able to pack it in. God bless them during their years of college. But it is necessary for the kids that had extenuating circumstances that maybe they had to to work for a living and not just have um, the ability to, um, you know, go do all these other things aside from going to college. Um, so yeah, slightly vague answer, but again, everything, you know, it's a big giant puzzle. It has a lot of pieces in it. Can you talk about the MCAT? And um, can you talk about the MCAT? And then what if you take it one more than once, maybe two times or three times? And, yeah. you know, the bad versus the good. So the person who has a 517 and takes it again and gets a 505 versus the person who has a 500 takes it again and gets a 512. Yeah. So you retook it and you got a better score. I don't care what your previous score was. Um, if you retook it because you had no clue why you didn't get in, um, and you dropped your score, guess what? I'm going to look at the lower score. Um, things that we look out for, I will tell you, everybody's bugaboo is the cars section, the critical thinking section, right? It's okay. That's where everybody flubs it. I, you know, I start tweaking my eyebrow a little bit at 125 or below on that section. As just a personal thing, don't take that as a institutional thing. Um, however, I would rather you have, if you're gonna have a lower score in any of the sections, have it there than in the hard sciences. You have a lower score in the hard sciences, that that's a bigger problem. So don't sweat it. And you know who scores, no matter how hard and how good they are, you know who scores lower? People who's, for whom English is a second language. Um, because it's it's stilted for people who, you know, English is their first language. Um, and you'd be surprised who, for whom English is a second language for people, like, right? English is my second language. Um, so uh, d don't feel bad about that. Um, uh, that's my thing there. And then, so, and yes, we really, really, really start to sweat. Um, I'll tell you if the number doesn't have a five in front of it, it's a problem. That's where, that's about as detailed as I'm going to get, uh, your total score is what I'm looking at. Um, because that's been, that, that's kind of the inflection point where we know you need extra help and, and, and are going to struggle more. So, um, uh, that, that's the long and the short of it. I, again, like everything else in what we look at, it's a complicated answer. Um, but, but seriously, don't sweat the 125 on the cars and seriously, um, don't retake it if you got a 517, cause I'm, you're just going to annoy me. So this is person has a question about, um, they have, a, do you look at differently if somebody has a 3.5 GPA in communications versus a 3.5 GPA in material science engineering? Don't care. Um, because everybody's a little bit different and everybody brings a little bit of different to the table. Your GPA is your GPA. As long as you met, we're going to pull, if, if, uh, let me put it this way. We're going to pull the hard sciences out of your GPA, no matter what you got. So if you did some liberal arts thing and then you ended up having to take, you know, biology or chemistry or whatever on the side, um, to meet the requisites to go to our medical school, then we're going to pull those out of your GPA. And, and so um, that's taken into account. We have people from all sorts of different types of, you know, history, philosophy, language, like, you know, um, a smattering of, of different things that, that don't have anything to quote unquote do with, with the hard medical sciences. Yeah. As long as you do your prereqs and you do yeah. well and do what you enjoy. I mean, you know, you know, uh, when I started, I wanted to do bioengineering and after taking physics and a bunch of, I was like, you know, this is cool and everything, but I don't know if I want to, so I, just what you do, what you enjoy, like, don't, yeah. 
get involved in this whole thing of what you think looks sexy, you know, more likely than not, if you major in something that you think looks sexy, but you hate it, you're more likely to not do well versus if philosophy is your thing, do it and then take your prereqs. And, yeah. and, and it's, you know, it's about like, you know, at some point, all these applications, you know, you know, um, person wants to know if they do, you know, do, do you want to see people do activities that are, locally or globally and getting a master's in glo global health would that help them at all yeah not an issue uh however i mean if it's again if it's part of what you did it's part of what you did i do take a little bit of issue and this becomes the quality of what you did is like people who put well all of my clinical activity and my clinical exposure was abroad oh that's fine and dandy points for you but that still doesn't give you an idea of what you're getting yourself into when you practice medicine in the United States. You got you you, you can't just post it all out abroad. You got to do something here in town, um, because uh, again, going back to the beginning, I want to know that you know what you're getting yourself into in American medicine. Not I'm not going to pick any country, but different continents. Uh, you know, the, the popular ones being, oh, I went to go all do all my work in Africa, Asia, or South America. That's fine. And I know I'm not, there's nothing wrong with any of that, but that doesn't help you figure out how American medicine is done. Yeah. And also, there's also something a little unethical where you can't do certain things here, but it's okay to go to a, another country that are browner and you are doing surgeries and stuff. That's becomes kind of unethical but i'm just yeah. going to throw that out there um some people are asking the question about is, is it mandatory that you join organizations and associations um there's nothing did... mandatory i, I would you know if, if there's anything that can i'll back it up a little bit there's nothing mandatory Absolutely nothing is mandatory. In fact, no two applications should look alike. And 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 here's my problem, right? I'm going to read well over 900 applications this year. I may get to a thousand, right? If you all do everything that's mandatory, how do I distinguish any one of you from anybody else, right? Again, I don't know how many times I can express this. Go do things that are unique to you, that make sense to you. Because imagine if everybody dug a well in Guatemala and everybody did Camp Kesem and everybody taught autistic kids how to, you know, I keep using these examples because I see them, but if everybody did the same thing because that's what was demanded, then that doesn't help me figure out anything about you that would make me want to select you different. I, I could just put you all up on a dartboard and start throwing darts and, and see where it lands nothing is mandatory, right? I'm making suggestions of what we look for. Um, so don't think that you have to do one spe specific thing, that if you do this one thing, it's gonna look better than you do the other thing. None of that is true. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a package, it's a gestalt. It starts to become a little subjective, right? Um, did you quote unquote, catch my interest? And, and is it entirely fair no, um, but is it also, and is it entirely subjective at the end? Yes, if you met all the requisites and I start going through your file to see which ones I'm gonna pick through, a little bit of yes. I mean, there's certain things that, that you know, make me look and go, okay, I wanna know more about this one. But the point is that that nothing is mandatory. There is no one script or, for, you all are looking for the one script or formula. I got news for you, you're not gonna find it. And nobody's going to tell you what it is because there is none. It's it's a it's a gestalt. It's an overall feeling. It's a warm fuzzies and and, and the unicorn. It, it, yes, are you the unicorn in in the forest? And so uh, don't look for don't don't try to get an answer out of me of of like oh if you do this and this and this and this you're guaranteed to get in because there is no guarantee. I I, I can tell you the kids with the, again the kids with the four point and the you know, 525 on their MCAT and they still don't get in because they didn't meet other aspects that I'm looking for. So, um, yeah, don't, don't look for it. Cause you're going to be wasting a lot of time. <laughs> Dr. Barrios, can you tell them how many people go through each of those seven to 8,000 applications? Yeah. There's a, there's a team of at least 10 of us, probably, I think it's 10. 
Um, I just, because it's my job, I do more than the others do. Um, and so I mean, I, but I can't do 4,000 applications. So, um, I do the good number of them because that, that, that's my job description, but we do have a whole team and the team changes a little bit and, and how many each member does changes a little bit. Um, and, and so, but we do ask that each team member do at least a hundred. Um, so they're not going through two or three, they're going through hundreds of these things, um, alongside me. So, uh, and each school does it a little bit differently depending on how many applications they have. I know God bless them. There's a few schools that they only have one person looking at them all the time. And I like, I, I would go insane, um, because I'm, I'm very clinically active as well. Um, and, and, and I don't have that luxury. Um, so, um, it, it, it varies, but there's a handful and they, and they're, they're quote unquote experts because they don't look at just one or two. They look at hundreds of, of them as I do. Um, the other question people have is about non-traditional students. What should non-traditional students do? How can they stand out? And also um, what, um, because they, they said that something about UCI doesn't like non-traditional students, which okay, okay. I doubt it, but please, I don't, please. I don't believe because please, I, I know if you, I, I, if you could post like where you heard this information from, and if you tell me read it, I'm just, my head's going to explode. Um, because non-traditional doesn't mean anything, right? Right. It just, I don't, I don't care. And, and, it, and it goes back to several of the other questions that other people asked, right? If you were non-traditional, why would I look at military kids? Why would I take a look at kids who, uh, you know, had to go do something else to make themselves viable, whether it was personally, economically, or for medical school. So I don't care. I, I just, it's not an issue. Like, like go back and tell whoever, told you that or where you heard that from that it's complete and utter bs because um uh, otherwise i would only look at people who are graduating in 2025 right and, and i wouldn't take anybody else um so and and based on everything that i just said um it wouldn't make any sense then why are you even here um and and so uh you're here because there is that possibility now what you did with that time again go back to the first five minutes of what I told you guys. Did you do some research? Did you do some clinical activity? Did you do some, uh, you know, community service of some sort? Like maybe you did a, a master's degree in social work and you were a social worker for five years before you decided to come back to medical school. I don't care. Um, did it make sense to you? You know, and did you meet all the prereqs? Uh, and, and did you weave that into something that was interesting about you? um is 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 the life lesson so i we have, have to, to let you go yeah i have to start running because i'm i'm off to go do um another like i tell people i'm kind of on the talk show circuit for so you want to go to medical school um um but but please you know my take home message before i go is is i hope you got something out of this number one because that's why i'm here and number two if it seemed like i was vague it's because i am i there is no specific one magic formula there's a lot it's, it's like that thousand piece jigsaw puzzle right i can't tell you that any one of those pieces is more important than the other one the final piece which is who are you i you know it's kind of funny like if you're a photographer I want to paint a picture or, or, or a painter. I want to put together a picture of who you are. It's a jigsaw puzzle. And at the end of the putting the puzzle together, I want to see who you are. And, and no one piece means more than another. Um, but take into account, you know, the, the aspects that I gave you, it's not much more mysterious or, or nitpicky than that. Um, and, and work towards your goal that way. Um, you know, hopefully that was helpful. Yes, sorry, um, we have to go, but uh, we try to answer as many questions as we could. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Barrios, uh, for coming. And uh, good luck on the next next one. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, I look forward to the next one. Thank you.